Hi and thanks for watching this video. My name is Marvin Munzu and I'm the Managing Director of Pre-Reg Shortcuts. So in this video, we're going to focus on a very important part of your exam, which is learning the MHRA drug safety updates of 2020. As you're meant to know this for your exams, they do come up in exam questions. And um, we're just going to go through quickly some of the main ones um, throughout this year. I've made this presentation very simple for you. So we're going to have from January all the way to December. So I was going to do this video a while ago, but I decided not to because it made more sense that I do this at the end of the year so that you have um, a summary of all the MHRA drug safety updates for the whole year. So thank you very much for watching this video. And um, we're going to go straight in into um, the slides what we're going to do today. So um, what we're going to cover and we're going to look at different MHRA uh, advice or uh, updates have happened this year. We're going to look at things like e-cigarettes, vaping, um, ondacetron, ingenol, mevitate gel, Valparate, Nexplanon, polypharmacy, esmia, benzodiazepines and opioids and a lot more medications. So the first one we're going to look at is um, from January. So I'm going to start from January each month all the way to December. So January 2020, we had an MHRA update for e-cigarettes and um, the e-cigarette use and also vaping. So um, the advice for healthcare professionals is to be absolutely vigilant um, for any suspected side effects with patients that use e-cigarettes or patients that vape. There's been a high risk um, of incidents of lung injury. So if there's any patient that presents, you need to um, observe any patient and um, advise patients as well, anyone that's using an e-cigarette or a vape, they need to be aware of um, any sort of respiratory symptoms, such as shortness of breath, coughing, um, chest pain, any sort of respiratory symptoms need um, to be reported to um, the GPs. Also, um, if there's any sort of side effects with vaping or e-cigarettes, these need to be reported to the MHRA via the yellow card scheme. Uh, the second update, again, January, we're gonna focus on January 1st, was on Dan Citron. Dantetron is um, an antiemetic used for nausea and vomiting. In this case, it is quite um, toxic when it's used in pregnant ladies. So in the first trimester in pregnancy, it is associated with a uh, risk of making the baby have a cleft lip or a cleft palate. So they are teratogenic and shouldn't be used during pregnancy. Um, just like e-cigarettes, you need to report any adverse reactions with ondansetron to um, the yellow card scheme um, to the MHRA. The next one I'm going to look at is not one that we really do a lot in the pharmacy. Um, Ingenol Mebitate Gel, brand name Picato. So um, recently, um, the license for this medication has been suspended. It is used to treat actinic keratosis. And recently, um, the license has been suspended because of a risk of um, skin malignancy. The next one, which is a very popular one, which should probably come up in your exam, is um, your Valparate. So um, it's not about new information because this was um, done last year. There were updates um, last year from the MHRA with um, sodium Valparate, especially regarding the pregnancy prevention program. But um, this year, it's not really focusing on new advice, but rather it's an improvement and um, of more new educational materials. So the new educational materials to support the pregnancy prevention program. And these are found in the patient cards, more patient cards for patients, um, patient booklets, booklets for healthcare professionals, annual risk acknowledgement forms. And all of these are just to provide more educational material um, regarding the use of sodium valparate. The next one, uh, which I did as well in the previous video, is Nexplanon. So um, Nexplanon is um, an implant, and um, recently there have been re reports of neurovascular injury, as well as migration of this contraceptive implant from the insertion point, insertion site, probably in your arm. And um, in some cases, the, the implant has migrated to the pulmonary artery. So that is quite um, dangerous. So um, with this implant, patients need to be advised about the potential of the implant migrating and knowing where to locate the site where the implant is. And if there's any migration, they need to be able to identify that. But even most importantly, the focus is on implants only being, next plan on implants only being done 
by healthcare professionals that are appropriately trained and accredited. Next one we're going to look at is um, a general um, patients taking multiple medications, so polypharmacy. So um, there's an alert for patients that have many medications. It's just an alert for adverse drug reactions. And uh, for patients taking more than one medication, um, they need to report any suspected ADRs to um, the yellow card scheme. The next one we're going to look at is ESMIA, which is ulipristal acetate. So um, there's been a suspension of ESMIA, and this is due to a risk of serious liver injury. And um, all patients on these medications have had to stop the medication. And the advice to patients or users that recently use this medication is to seek any sort of immediate um, medical attention if they get any signs of liver toxicity. So any signs such as um, nausea, vomiting, malaise, jaundice, anorexia. If they experience any of these signs, they need to um, inform the GP. Also, we need to report any ADRs to the yellow card scheme. And um, an important aspect that I need to stress is ulipristal acetate. It's also um, your LR1. That's the same ingredient. But this only applies to ESMIA. This doesn't apply to LR1. So there are no concerns with um, ulipristal acetate for LR1, which is used as emergency contraception. The next thing is in March, it's March 2020. Um, benzodiazepines and opioids, so there's a risk of um, potentially fatal respiratory depression, which um, we covered this on the combo course with your opioids and your benzodiazepines. So um, the advice is um, you shouldn't prescribe a benzodiazepine and an opioid together because of the risk of that combination is a high risk of respiratory depression. So the only times when these should be prescribed together is only when there isn't any other alternative. So generally avoid prescribing a benzodiazepine such as diazepam with an opioid such as methadone together as this could increase the risk of the patient getting respiratory depression. The next um, update which was again in March 2020, is your SGLT2 inhibitors, which are normally used in diabetes. So um, for patients that stop taking this medication, there's been a rare risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. So especially when patients come in for a booked for surgery and they have to stop taking the medications before surgery. In that case, uh, the patient has a risk of uh, getting diabetic ketoacidosis. And so the advice is anytime this medication is stopped, Patients also need to be monitored, the ketones need to be monitored as well to make sure that um, they don't have any risk of um, getting diabetic ketoacidosis. So um, the normally say monitor ketones in blood during treatment, interruption for surgical procedures or acute serious medical illness. So anytime you stop SGLT2 inhibitors, you need to also monitor ketones to make sure there's no risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, I didn't put anything for April because I didn't really have any updates. But um, May 2020 was um, there's a new COVID-19 um, yellow card reporting site. So this is not much to take away, but it's just having that awareness that um, in May 2020 there was a new site reporting site dedicated um, for COVID. Um, reporting and the use of any new dedicated COVID-19 yellow card reporting site to report all suspected side effects associated with any medicines used in patients with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. June 2020, um, cyproterone acetate. So um, with this medication in June 2020, um, there's a risk of meningioma, which is literally an intracranial tumor. So with cyproterone acetate, um, there's a risk of getting an intracranial tumor. And um, this is obviously increased the higher the dose. So um, the highest risk is normally from 25 milligrams and above a day. So that increases the risk of meningioma. So the, there's been new advice that's been put out by the MHRA in ways, um, advice on ways that you can minimize the risk of meningioma. Still in June 2020, direct acting oral anticoagulants, your DOAX. So um, just like it has been previously, is to be vigilant of signs and symptoms of bleeding with your anticoagulants. Complications during treatment with DOAX, such as apixaban, edoxaban, dabigatran, rivaroxaban. But um, these signs of bleeding are also higher in high-risk patients, such as your elderly patients, patients with a low body weight 
or patients with renal impairment. So you need to advise these patients to watch out for um, any bleeding or the risk of bleeding. There has also been uh, many reversal agents in, uh, in, in the case where you have an overdose for this specific anticoagulant and some of them have come up in exam questions. So you need to know the antidotes to use for your anticoagulant. For example, with Dabigatran, you have Praxbind, which is Idarocizumab, and this is um, used as an antidote or a reversal agent if you have a Dabigatran overdose. Then you have Apixaban and Rivaroxaban, and the um, antidote for these two are uh, Ondexia, and, uh, Ondexia, which is a brand name, and the generic name is Adnexanet Alpha. There isn't any agent at the moment, any reversal agent for a Doxaban. Now we're going to go to August. I didn't have anything for July, but now we're going to go into August 2020. This is absolutely important. My guess is you could potentially get a question in the exam on stimulant laxatives because these are OTC and these are very common medications. So there has been a few changes this year um, on stimulant laxatives. So the main changes of main advice have been on the pack size of the new restrictions on pack sizes that are sold um, in public and that are sold um, directly to um, patients from say general sale outlets such as supermarkets. There's also been a revision um, on the ages. So um, there's revised recommended age um, ages for use. Um, safety warnings for OTC stimulant laxatives such as your bisacodyls, your senas, your senocytes, um, sodium um, pickle sulfate. And this is for those that use orally as well as rectally. So the advice is um, generally with your stimulant laxatives are not advised to be used as first line. So first line is normally dietary and lifestyle advice. But now your um, the new advice is only use stimulant laxatives if other laxatives such as your bulk forming laxatives and your osmotic laxatives are ineffective. So stimulant laxatives will only be used when you've already tried lifestyle dietary lifestyle measures, you've used bulk forming laxatives, you've tried osmotic laxatives, only then do you use stimulant laxatives. Also in terms of the, um, the ages, children less than 12 should not use stimulant laxatives without advice from prescribing. So in a pharmacy, you can um, sell um, a stimulant laxative to anyone that's above 12, but any child or anyone that's less than 12 needs a prescription or needs to at least see a prescriber. To be prescribed a stimulant laxative. Large packs as well of stimulant laxatives will no longer be available from general cell outlets such as news agents and supermarkets. So there's also been a reduction in the quantity that you can buy from these um, outlets. So I've put this on here for you. It's um, a screenshot that I got from um, the MHRA website. Um, it just shows you the changes such as pack size restrictions, um, the revised recommended ages for use. So I'm just going to read that section because this absolutely is very important. Um, stimulant laxatives on general sale in shops and supermarkets will be recommended for use only in people 18 years or older. Stimulant laxatives should no longer be used in children under 12 years without advice from a prescriber. Wild products for children aged 12 to 17 years can be supplied under the supervision of a pharmacist. So that's so important to really learn this revised recommended age use because my guess is you could potentially have this in the exam because this is very important and it's a very common, um, these are common products that you sell everyday OTC. So August 2020, clozapine and other antipsychotics. So all of you down the combo course, you know, we talk about clozapine it is a very strong antipsychotic. It is a bit different from most other um, antipsychotics. But um, recently, um, there's been reports um, with this medication of toxicity, especially in certain patients that have certain conditions, such as pneumonia, serious infection, patients that stop smoking or that switch to e-cigarettes or patients that take other drugs due to interactions. So because of um, the risk of toxicity in these um, type of patients, the advice has been to increase monitoring of the blood concentration of clozapine. So there needs to be frequent monitoring on blood concentration of clozapine that, to reduce the risk of toxicity in patients with certain clinical um, situations. So blood level monitoring of other antipsychotics as well for toxicity may be helpful in certain circumstances. So um, the main thing is for clozapine, but at the same time also other antipsychotics um, monitoring will be helpful. But um, with clozapine, you definitely need to monitor blood concentration for toxicity with patients that fall any of these clinical um, situations that I've mentioned um, previously. 
So again, in August, um, Benosumab, which is Prolia, 60 milligrams. I do this a lot in my pharmacy. Um, um, always get this for the surgery. It is a common medication that's used for osteoporosis for certain patients. And um, recently, it's been found that there's an increased risk of multiple vertebral fractures. So um, especially when patients stop taking these medications, within um, 18 months of stopping the medications, there is a risk of multiple vertebral fractures or delaying ongoing prolia 60 milligram treatment for osteoporosis. So patients with a previous history or previous vertebral fracture, they may be at highest risk. So any patient that's had a previous vertebral fracture will be at a higher risk of um, getting uh, multiple um, fractures with prolia. So patients should not stop um, denosumab without specialist review because you want to prevent that risk of getting multiple vertebral fractures. Again, in August 2020, isotretinoin, Roaccutane, which is another um, common medication in the pharmacy. It is normally used only for very, very severe acne. And that's when you've tried other things, like you've tried antibiotics and you've tried other topical therapies. And only then um, do you use isotretinoin. Um, the, the, the issue with isotretinoin is there's been reports of significant teratogenic psychiatric reactions and sexual dysfunction risk. So um, this should be avoided, not used um, on women with childbearing potential unless they're part of a pregnancy prevention program. Also, patients need to be monitored with signs of um, psychiatric reactions such as um, depression, um, suicidal thoughts, and also for sexual dysfunction as well. So um, it's very important you learn this about isotretinoin, and this has been a recent update as well. So one that's been um, there for a while, which uh, every single year seems to be stressed upon, is um, again in August 2020, we're looking at emollients. And this refers to all your emollients. So it could all be your Dipro bases, all your emollients, your double base gels. All emollients have a very high risk of severe and fatal burns. So emollients um, normally can be transferred from the skin onto clothing, onto beddings, onto dressings and other fabrics. So um, once this happens, once this has been transferred to other fabrics, then these fabrics have a very high um, risk of getting in ignited if they're exposed to a naked flame. So just need to be aware that if you're using a lot of emollients, um, you need to be aware that the fabrics around your house, your bedding, your clothing could um, be ignited very easily by a naked flame. So avoid exposing any of the fabrics um, to any flames. And this applies to all emollients, whether they contain paraffin or not. September 2020, opioids, uh, risk of dependence and addiction. And this is normally associated uh, with prolonged use. And when we talk about prolonged use, we're looking at when this is used for more than three months. So any patient that uses an opioid for more than three months has an increased risk of dependence and addiction. And this advice has to be given for patients when it is used for non-cancer pain. September 2020, transdermal fentanyl patches. There's been an MHRA um, update as well. For example, your matrophen. So with um, fentanyl transdermal patches, they are now contraindicated in opioid naive patients in the UK. So when we say opioid naive, we mean um, patients that have not used opioids before. So um, because um, these fentanyl patches have a very, very high and significant risk of causing respiratory depression, the advice is this should only be used on patients, um, non-cancer patients. This should only be used on patients that have previously tolerated an opioid in the past. So um, before using fentanyl, make sure that the patient has been at least stabilized or is a bit stable with an opioid first. But using a fentanyl um, patch directly on a patient that has never had an opioid before presents a very high risk of them getting respiratory depression. So the advice is to use other analgesics and other opioid medicines for non-cancer pain before prescribing fentanyl patches. September 2020, methotrexate, another important update. So methotrexate can be used um, for certain conditions. It can be used daily, but um, we're looking at when the use once weekly. So for example, in many autoimmune conditions and in some cancer therapies, methotrexate is recommended to be used once weekly. What has happened is there's many reports where patients have been given this medication daily instead of weekly. So the new measures are to reduce the risk of overdosing a patient or to reduce the risk of a patient 
taking methotrexate daily instead of once weekly. So um, healthcare professionals are reminded to, to remind patients and carers of the weekly dosing and decide with patients what day and note down on the prescription and on the box, the prescription box, what day of the week they're going to take the medication. So anything that's going to help them provide information that's going to help them to remember that they need to take that medication once a week and not daily. So I'll put this again, this is an extract um, from MHRA website. So changes to the instructions and packs, the product information and outer and inner packaging of all methotrexate products for once weekly dosing will now carry a warning about the dosing schedule and the consequences of dosing errors. The outer package warning will also include a space for the dispenser to write the day of the week for intake. Advice on dividing that once weekly dose is being removed from the product information since this was identified as a source of confusion that could lead um, to medication error. So these are the changes that is worth knowing. There will be changes to the instructions as well as the packaging to make sure that patients take this medication once weekly and not once daily especially for autoimmune conditions and also other cancer therapies. Insulins, this could potentially come up in an exam and these are high risk drugs as well as part of your GPC framework. Insulins are high risk. So um, there's a risk of cutaneous amyloidosis. So this is um, sort of damage to your skin. So especially when you use the same site over and over again. So um, risk of um, cutaneous amyloidosis at injection sites for all insulins which may affect your glycemic control. So the advice um, for patients is on patients that use an insulin is to rotate the injection site and that's going to prevent the risk of skin damage, prevent the risk of lipodystrophy. And um, that's the main um, update for insulins. The site needs to be rotated all the time to prevent um, damage to the skin, which will affect um, glycemic control. October 2020, fluorouracil intravenous. So new recommendations for five fluorouracil and related medicines to minimize the risk of life-threatening toxicity. So in patients that have um, what we call a DPD deficiency, so a dihydropyrimidine dihydrogenase, so it's an enzyme. Certain patients have a deficiency in this enzyme. And for patients that have a deficiency in this enzyme, they have a high um, life-threatening toxicity risk if they're given 5 fluoro -uracil. So the advice is to, to, in order to prevent that, is to make sure that patients are tested. So DPD testing is recommended before initiation to identify patients at increased risk of severe and fatal toxicity. So the main aim is to test the patients first to make sure that they are not DPD deficient. And if they're not DPD deficient, then you can use their medications. If they are, then they have a high risk of getting life-threatening toxicity with 5 fluoro -uracil. Another um, update, October 2020, this is some more high-risk drugs for you, so this may come up in your exam, warfarin and other anticoagulants. So, um, warfarin and other anticoagulants, acute illness may be exaggerated, or um, acute illness may exaggerate the effects of warfarin, and this may necessitate a reduction in dose. So, patients that have got COVID, for instance, COVID-19, um, if a patient is presenting with symptoms of COVID, and the warfarin or other anticoagulants, then this may actually increase the effect of the warfarin. So they need to be reviewed and um, for a dose reduction. Patients on warfarin or other vitamin K antagonists should inform their GP if they have symptoms of or confirmed COVID-19 infection. Monitor patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's an update to make sure that patients are monitored effectively during COVID-19 um, pandemic or patients that take warfarin and other anticoagulants. November 2020, modafinil. So modafinil is indicated as an indicated treatment for excessive sleepiness and that's normally associated with um, narcolepsy. So with this medication, there's been a potential risk of congenital malformations when used in pregnancy. So this medication needs to be avoided in pregnant women, in women of childbearing age, avoiding pregnancy, avoiding women of childbearing potential, um, use effective contraception during treatment and for two months after stopping modafinil. So it's important to just know about modafinil and to know that modafinil should not be used in pregnant women or in women of childbearing age um, without the use of contraception. 
Um, another important update is with Zyban. Zyban is normally used um, for smoking cessation. Um, so cases of serotonin syndrome in patients using um, Zyban. So for instance, a patient using Zyban that's on citalopram or, or say on fluoxetine. So the combination of Zyban with any serotonergic medications such as your SSRI, such as your citalopram, such as your paroxetines, such as your SNRIs like venlafaxine. If patients take any of these medications and Zyban as well, they have an increased risk of getting serotonin syndrome. Again, we've covered this on the course, on the combo course. You have all the details and the symptoms of serotonin syndrome. So patients that are given both medications, for instance, um, citalopram and Zyban, um, need to be advised of the signs and symptoms of serotonin syndromes, such as nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, and increased heart rate. December 2020, so we're coming to the end of the year, systemic and inhaled fluoroquinolone. So fluoroquinolones examples, we covered this in chapter five in our course, um, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, ofloxacin, these are all fluoroquinolones. So the advice is there's a small risk of heart valve regurgitation associated with the systemic and inhaled use of these antibiotics. So um, the main advice for patients is to seek any medical attention if they experience any rapid onset of shortness of breath, swelling of the ankles, of the feet, swelling of the abdomen, and any new onset of heart palpitation. So any sort of um, onset of new symptoms regarding the heart, these need to be reported as this could be um, a, a sign of um, heart valve regurgitation. So um, finally, we've got erythromycin, a very important antibiotic, worth knowing this as well, may come up in your exam. So um, now there is a caution, um, it's required due to cardiac risk. So um, cardiac risk increases the risk of QT interval prolongation. So erythromycin, this needs to be avoided um, in patients with a history of QT interval for the prolongation, ventricular cardiac arrhythmia, and patients with electrolyte disturbances. So any patient that has any of these or history of any of these need to um, avoid erythromycin. So there's also been um, drug interactions between erythromycin, which is a macrolide, and a DOAC, such as rivaroxaban. So um, drug interactions between these medications, macrolides with DOACs, for example, erythromycin and rivaroxaban is now included in the literature of erythromycin. And um, there is an increased risk of bleeding when a macrolide and a DOAC are given together. So you need to inform all patients that are taking erythromycin, for example, and rivaroxaban um, to report any signs of bleeding, any symptoms of bleeding. So that's it um, for all the updates I've taken you from January 2020 all the way to December 2020. It's been a pleasure and um, I hope this has been helpful for you. If you found this very useful, then please subscribe or in, most importantly, like this video, share this video. If you like this video, I'm going to know whether this is helpful. Also, um, the slides, if you want, if you're interested in the slides, so um, all of this, of uh, this presentation, the slides will be available to all the students on the combo course. You'll be able to access the slides to be sent directly to you if you want the slides. Um, for more information on our combo course, which we do twice a year in October and um, February, you could um, just look at the description below. There is a link um, talking about the course. You can also join our free mailing list where you get daily questions for about 40 days, GPHC style questions with answers to help you with your revision. It is a free mailing list to join and um, the link is in the description as well below. You could visit our website, which is www.preredshortcuts.com or you could email us if you want to um, probably speak to us. Email us on gphccourse at gmail.com. So thank you very much and I wish you all the best in your exams, all the best of luck. Now you have all the updates for MHRA, the main ones. Read this and um, I wish you all the best. I believe you're going to pass. I believe in you. So you need to believe in yourself. Take care and I'll see you all soon. Bye.